Okay, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started with this second session. I'm Bobby Robbins. I'm the uh, director of the Cardiovascular Institute here at Stanford, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. So my day job is a heart surgeon, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you all here. It's been a very exciting week uh, here at Stanford, launching our campaign for the Medical Center. Uh, it's beautiful weather this week, great day today. Uh, hopefully you're all going to get well educated and then go out this afternoon and enjoy yourselves. Exercise, yes. Uh, we were just two as I just talking with, uh, Dr. Hanafi. Yeah, not only is exercise good in Howard, not only is exercise good for your heart, it's good for your brain too. I, I hear Dr. Longo. Uh, so how many people went to Dr. Longo's talk earlier? Wow. What about Dr. Butte's? Yeah, yeah, okay. I kind of want to give my time to Dr. Butte because he was so <laughs> incredible. Uh, but anyway, so I'll, I'll get started here. Today we're going to talk about stem cells, but before we get started, I just want to give a, um, a, a happy Mother's Day to all of you mothers here in the audience, and thank you for being here today. Yeah, but a big, big round of applause, because it is, by, uh, it is the hardest job in the world, and, and sometimes the, the most thankless job. So happy Mother's Day to everybody uh, here today who's a mother. So I'm going to talk about um, the, the possibility of using stem cells to repair a damaged heart. Um, the Cardiovascular Institute at Stanford, uh, there, there are several institutes. There's a cancer institute, there's a neurosciences stem cell institute, and the Cardiovascular Institute seeks to bring together everyone across the entire university who has an interest in cardiovascular science and health with the goal to translate discoveries to improve the health of our patients and people in the, in the entire world from a cardiovascular standpoint. So I'm going to start with a story about what I think is one of the greatest translational uh, discovery stories ever, and that's heart transplant. Uh, this is the, the first animal of any type, uh, first living thing, as Dr. Shumway used to say. This is, uh, this is unfortunately, I want walk around, but I'm being videoed, and I don't have a laser pointer, so I'm going to stand here so the camera can see me. But this is Dr. Shumway, and this is Ralphie the dog, who is the first living thing, first living being, to survive one year following a heart transplant. This was, uh, this was done uh, over 10 years of dedicated, multidisciplinary, collaborative work in the labs here at Stanford, and it resulted in, in the, uh, the first successful This is Dr. Shumway doing the first successful heart transplant in the United States here at Stanford in January of 1968. Uh, this followed quickly after uh, with the idea that not only could the heart be replaced, but also both the heart and both lungs in an operation called a heart-lung transplant, the first ever done in the world. You can see Dr. Bruce Wrights here who pioneered this operation and Dr. Wrights and Dr. Shumway doing the, the operation. So this is what we're talking about when you hear the word translational research. There was a problem at the bedside. People were dying from heart failure. There were no drugs. There was no other option. And heart transplant was the only option to save a person's life. It required going from the, from the bedside to the bench, 10 years of hard work of discovery, and then coming back to the bedside to translate that discovery. And now, uh, as they say, the rest is history with heart transplantation. This doesn't happen overnight. And one of the great things that, uh, that Dr. Shumway did then, and we continue to have a culture here at Stanford today, is one of collaboration. We're, as, as Dean Pizzo always says, we're a small research intensive school of medicine, and we're very close to our colleagues. And it forces us uh, to, to be collaborative. Uh, because we don't, we don't have thousands of people uh, in, in, in a big university. We've got the great, great uh, advantage of being on the campus of one of the world's greatest universities. But it, it requires us to work as teams. And I think all of the major discoveries, all of the things that are going to change healthcare are going to come from collaborative teamwork. And this is just a picture of our uh, heart transplant team uh, that was taken around the time of the uh, 40th anniversary of that first heart transplant that Dr. Shumway uh, performed here at Stanford in 1968. So today I'm going to uh, just briefly touch on cardiac transplantation talk a little bit about artificial hearts, left ventricular assist devices, and then the most important thing is to, uh, is to tell you that we've built over the last 10 years a great internationally recognized team 
of cardiac stem cell uh, researchers in a program that we are, we're going to translate into humans, we hope, very soon. So the problem of congestive heart failure, uh, it's, uh, it's the leading cause of death, just not just cardiovascular death, but all death, uh, all the deaths in, in the uh, United States. More people die from heart failure every year than all cancers combined. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the economics of it, $40 billion a year in, in U.S. healthcare dollars are spent to, uh, to treat patients with heart failure, and it represents about 5% of the total uh, healthcare budget that's expended in the nation every year. So this is another story that I, I think you'll find um, uh, instructive and entertaining. So this is a young man uh, who calls himself English Joe. His name is Joe Matthews, and several years ago, I was sitting in my, uh, in my office and I got a call from the cath lab uh, to come over. Joe Matthews was a 21-year-old gentleman who was a uh, professional rugby player. He's from the UK and he came over to the United States to play rugby. And he noticed that uh, some of the players were actually older than him. And as you can see from the picture uh, on the left with the, with the baseball hat on, he, is, uh, he, he was in incredible shape, strapping, good-looking, very athletic guy. And he noticed that some of his older teammates were outperforming him. When he tried to run, he was short of breath, didn't quite keep up. So he's finally made his way to, a, uh, to his local doctor who took an x-ray, and his, his, uh, his heart was massively enlarged. He was uh, referred here to Stanford because people who have heart failure, whose heart doesn't work very well, are at great risk of sudden death. So he was transferred here to Stanford to get a, an, an internal cardiac fibrillation. And that's a device that uh, is really uh, quite remarkable in that it can sense when the heart is failing from, a, from an arrhythmia, either ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And it can shock you, like on TV when you see the paddles in the, in the hospital and people get shocked. This is all done implanted and, and, um, and, and does the shock internally. Well, in order, to, in order for that to work, you have to check whether the, the device is actually in the right settings and it'll, and it'll work. So you have to induce one of these uh, malignant arrhythmias, ventricular fibrillation or tachycardia. So in the cath lab that day, they induced Joe Matthews' heart to fibrillate, to stop, so that they could test to see if the device was going to work. Well, it didn't work, and they couldn't defibrillate him, and so they called me, and I ran over, and we rushed him to the operating room, and you can see him uh, lying in the bed in one of these pictures there because he needed an artificial heart to keep him alive. Uh, there was nothing we could do. There was no other conventional operation we could do, so we put an artificial heart in, and luckily, because he was strong, he survived. And, and went on to make it through his operation. A month later, he got a, a, a donor that was uh, suitable for him, and he got a heart transplant. He's now going on to be, uh, you can see him here in this picture, a great outspoken advocate. You can go back uh, uh, to his website, EnglishJoe.net, and you can read his whole story. And it's quite, he's quite the uh, marketeer for organ transplantation and for Stanford, by the way. He's a great ambassador. So he's now the fastest human in the world that's ever received any kind of transplant. He's blowing by even the guys who got, merely got a kidney transplant. And that's a great, inspiring story. And, but it doesn't stop there. Why did this 21-year-old strapping man's heart fail? There are two reasons why we do transplants. One is from coronary artery disease, and I'll show you a picture later. And, uh, hopefully not too close to lunch that it, uh, it'll upset you too much of what a heart attack looks like, a real picture. So that's about half of the people who get cardiac transplants have heart attacks. And we know the things that we, we should do to try to prevent, uh, b prevent coronary artery disease. The second group though, is called idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. Idiopathic means we have no idea why the heart fails. So in Joe Matthews' case, his coronary arteries look great perfectly normal, his heart muscle looked fine, his electrical system was fine, his valves looked okay, but his heart failed. The muscle just didn't squeeze. It's, it's true that your heart is about the size of your fist in your chest. And Joe Matthews' heart, because I put my hands around his heart, was the size of a basketball, this big, and it was failing. And how can that be that just six months before, 
that this, this gentleman was playing professional rugby, but his heart fell. So that's one of the great challenges and one of the things that the Cardiovascular Institute is really focused on. Try to understand the mechanism of why the heart fails and come up with novel and innovative therapies to treat heart failure, one of which is going to be stem cells. So in 2000, there was a paper published by these two gentlemen, Pierre Anversa, who uh, is now in Boston, and Don Orlick, who is at the National Institutes of Health. And they published a paper that really uh, received a lot of attention and a lot of press about how cardiovascular uh, diseases, particularly heart attacks and heart failure, were going to be transformed by this work. This was work in rodents and rats that showed that if you take adult bone marrow cells and you inject into the heart, magically these bone marrow cells turn into cardiac muscle and the heart beats, and that's going to be the cure for all, all heart failure. So we'd been working on this uh, for about three or four years. Irv Weissman, who I'm sure is a familiar name to, to many in the audience, he directs the, the Stem Cell Institute here at, at Stanford. Um, he discovered the, the markers for uh, both mouse and human uh, stem cells, hemopoietic stem cells. And if the world is fair, he'll win the Nobel Prize for this work. Well, Irvin and I had been working in this area, and I'd been pushing him, and we'd been using skeletal myoblasts and, and bone marrow cells to try to treat heart failure in, in rats. And, and when this paper came out, and, and Irvin and I live about a block from each other on the campus here. I could walk to my house in about 15 minutes. And so this paper came out on a Friday. Saturday morning, I'm at home, and the phone rings, and Irv calls me and said, did you see that article in Nature? I said, yeah, isn't it exciting? I told you, you know, they beat us to the punch. We were, we were almost there. He goes, it's complete rubbish. Not possible. Cannot be possible that a bone marrow cell, an adult bone marrow cell, can magically differentiate into a, in a heart cell. So we began uh, working, trying to reduplicate this work. And in, um, in Nature in 2004, we published a paper that was published at the same time. This is a picture of Irv and, and one of my uh, postdocs, Eura Balsam, who did this work. We published this work in Nature along with a group in, in uh, Seattle led by Chuck Murray that, that confirmed what Irv said, that adult cells cannot magically turn into other types of cells. The only cells that we know that can do that are embryonic stem cells and now iPS cells, inducible pluripotent stem cells, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So that really changed the, the, um, the world because in that intervening three to four years when, uh, when uh, Inversa and Orly had published their paper, it became rampant that people all over the world were taking cells and they were claiming that any kind of cell with a catheter injected into the heart would heal, uh, would heal heart failure. I think uh, Don, uh, what was the guy from Hawaii, Don Ho, or uh, uh, you know, went and got in and claimed that he was, uh, you know, magically cured. And so, um, an important thing happened once our paper was published. I, I think it, it it stopped all of this um, unrealistic hype about what biology could could do, and and also importantly, the FDA stepped in. And for the first time, a, a biologic, a cell, was regulated by the FDA. And so now you have to apply for what's called an, uh, an IND, an investigational new drug uh, permit, to be able to do stem cell injections into humans. So when we think about uh, in injecting cells into the heart, uh, there, there are a couple of factors that one must consider. One is the patient population. There are basically two. One is the Joe Matthews heart failure needs a transplant. The other population is, are those patients that have an acute heart attack, acute myocardial infarction, that uh, cells uh, going into the heart hopefully can prevent damage. There are different cell types that can be used. I'll go over a few of those. Cell survival factors. Um, a, a lot of the work that I'll talk about today is in collaboration with Irv Weissman and Joe Wu. Joe Wu is really one of the leading uh, stem cell, cardiac stem cell biologists in the world, and uh, we're very fortunate to have him here at Stanford. 
One of the things that we have a tremendous advantage over all the competition is our imaging facilities here. Uh, Sam Gambier is speaking in the next room, and luckily we get to watch, watch our uh, colleagues in their talks because these are being filmed. But Sam brought Joe here from, uh, with him from UCLA, and, and we really have an incredible advantage because we have an, a molecular imaging uh, core in the Clark Center that is second to none in the world that allows us to follow the fate of these stem cells. And it turns out, that most of the cells that are injected in the heart within the first week or so have died. So that's, that's going to be an important thing. Are there things that we can do to make the cell survive longer? Uh, then the imaging I talked about, and then what the mechanism of action is. Uh, there, there is some controversy about, well, can some of these adult cells cause the heart to improve transiently? But uh, the mechanism of action that we're, we seek is, is really growing new heart muscle and having that heart muscle, this new heart muscle, connect to the, the heart muscle that's still in the heart that works well, the viable uh, muscle that's not been damaged. And so that's going to be an important, uh, important mechanism of action for us. So here's sort of a current list of the, the type of cells uh, that can be used. We've covered bone marrow cells, and, and there are still people who are injecting bone marrow cells. I'm, I'm not really sure why they're doing that, but uh, they, they're modifying these bone marrow cells. But just to be clear about it, everyone uh, realizes from, from the work we did originally here that bone marrow cells will not turn into to new heart muscle. Uh, then there's skeletal myoblasts. Uh, you know, even though we started with these cells, I, I never quite understood uh, how that was going to work. What, what we were thinking is that the skeletal muscle would, would grow and um, prevent the heart from dilating, and maybe that would help. It turns out that it caused arrhythmias in the heart, and that's basically been abandoned. Then there, there are so-called mesenchymal stem cells that, um, that are adult cells. Again, some people think that there's a possibility that these cells could differentiate, differentiate into a heart muscle cell, uh, but there's no great evidence for that. There is a new area. I'll talk mostly about embryonic stem cells and iPS cells, but there is some new interest in, is it possible that in our heart there are cells, a small number of cells, that are able to divide? We're, we're taught in medical school that the brain and the heart, the cells in both of those organs don't divide. You're bo born with X number of cells, and they don't divide. We're beginning to realize, certainly for the brain, I know Irv and, uh, and some of the neuroscientists have, have discovered that there are cells that divide. The heart, they're still, it's still um, controversial. But it's possible that there are cells, at least uh, in the heart, that would be um, capable, if treated with the right genes, to differentiate into new cardiac cells. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end. Uh, and then there's embryonic stem cells and in inducible pluripotent stem cells. So, this is where we've done a lot of our work uh, here at Stanford, is, is using the mouse here on the, uh, in, with the green ears and uh, all the cells in this mouse uh, express a green fluorescent protein, which is a marker for us to be able to use the molecular imaging I talked about to follow the, the mice. And, uh, and it's been a very valuable uh, tool for us to, to gain new knowledge into uh, whether these cells go, uh, stay where they're, they're injected and, and what the fate of them are. So embryonic stem cells, uh, uh, when, when an egg is fertilized, there's one cell. And then that cell divides into two cells. And those cells divide into four, uh, eight, 16. And at a certain point, up, up to the time of about 64 cells, all of these cells, if you take one, a, a cell from this inner, inner cell mass of this blastocyst, which is the, at about the 64 cell state, these are embryonic stem cells. So the question is, why does one of these cells, let's say cell A, become skeletal muscle and cell B become heart muscle? Unknown. There, there are certainly uh, genes that we're beginning to understand uh, how to differentiate these cells. So, uh, the, the embryonic stem cells can develop into any cell in the body and will. But at some point, they, become, they go down a path of differentiation, and there are certain signals that are turned on and certain signals turned off that causes the cells to either become a heart cell or a brain cell or a liver cell. So that's an important point. Uh, the second is that um, if you take these cells that are undifferentiated, then put them into a human, try to become every cell in the body. 
And the problem with that is that there are tumors that are formed called teratomas. That's why there have only been five people in the world ever that have gotten embryonic stem cells. Three for spinal cord injury, two of which were done here by Gary Steinberg in collaboration with a, with a clinical study that Geron sponsored. Unfortunately, Geron uh, stopped that trial and got out of the stem cell business. And then there were two patients um, who received embryonic stem cells to treat macular degeneration, but that's it. We believe our group has an application in, and, and we've been given a lot of positive feedback, and we learn next month whether uh, the California Institutes of Regenerative Medicine are going to award us $20 million that if we win that grant, it'll allow our group to be the first group in the world ever to put embryonic stem cells into a heart. And I think that uh, is a great translational story, just like heart transplantation. This is an example of, of how big thoughts and big ideas can be accomplished at a place like Stanford. I just wanted to put this slide in because this shows you what a human embryonic stem cell transplanted in the heart developed into cardiac tissue. This is exactly what a cardiac uh, muscle looks like. It was an embryonic stem cell, a human embryonic stem cell that was injected into a mouse heart that had a heart attack. You can see the striated bands that look just like cardiac muscle. These uh, red um, uh, areas are uh, expressing protein called connexin 43, which means that this new cardiac muscle is connecting to other viable cardiac muscle that's left into the heart. And that's going to be an important uh, part of any therapeutic approach for treating heart failure. Now, there are problems with embryonic stem cells. I, I covered with you the problem of, uh, of teratomas. So the way we get around that is that we know these protocols that we can give genes to these cells and differentiate them until this embryonic stem cell develop into a heart cell. And then we purify those cells and put into the heart. The problem with embryonic stem cells is that they come from embryos, so there are certain ethical and moral issues that have been well publicized. The second thing is that the embryo has a genetic code. Now, we heard a, a tool Butte talk uh, uh, in the last session, those of you who were in that session, about the genetic code. But suffice it to say that the embryo has a certain group of antigens that are different if I'm getting those cells from an embryo, and my immune system will try to, uh, to reject those cells. So that's the second problem with embryonic stem cells, and then the, the teratoma is the third. So there's a new type of cell that was discovered uh, in 2005 called inducible pluripotent stem cells, iPS cells. And so these are cells that, um, uh, the way that this works is you can take any adult cell in the body. The easiest thing to do is to take a, a biopsy from the skin called a fibroblast. And then there are four important genes that can reprogram these cells into pluripotent stem cells. They're just like embryonic stem cells, except they're your cells. And then those can be used to uh, go on to differentiate into cardiac cells or neuro cells. Uh, and then they can be used for therapeutic approaches to treat heart failure or, or Parkinson's disease or diabetes. Moreover, every drug that you consume is tested by regulation, by the FDA, but it's tested for toxicity in a very rudimentary hamster cell model called the CHO cell. And it's simply whether the calcium channel works, yes or no. There was a drug called Cisapride back in the uh, 90s that was given for gastric motility. If you had reflux esophagitis or reflux disease, you were given Cisapride in your your, uh, your GI system moved, moved forward. It was a multi-billion dollar drug. It was screened through these CHO cells and deemed to not have any cardiac toxicity. However, that drug had to be pulled from the market because there were over 80 deaths from a condition known as prolonged QT syndrome. If you look at the QRS complex from an EKG, it's a prolongation that causes uh, these deadly arrhythmias, either ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. Just imagine, and what we're doing here at Stanford, we're developing 1,000 IPS lines from people that have ver a variety of different uh, uh, cardiac diseases, coronary artery disease, dilated cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation, 
from all ages, all ethnicities. And just imagine that before you take a drug to market, you could test in a Petri dish whether this drug had an effect on the QRS complex. Because these IPS cells in a dish can be beating, you can measure an electrocardiogram, and you can determine whether that drug would have toxicity and, and produce this, in, this um, disease called prolonged QT syndrome. So those are three uh, areas that I think IPS cells will be used. One for therapy, one for drug screening, and then to understand mechanisms. Uh, think about, we just had a major uh, publication about mechanisms of how aortic aneurysms form in Marfan's patients. And to be able to test this, instead of doing a big clinical trial that costs a lot of money and can be dangerous, you could develop IPS cells, cardiac cells from patients with Marfan's disease, and basically do clinical trials in a Petri dish. Think about that, and we can get to that in the uh, question and answer session. So coming back to the uh, forms of heart failure, I think that stem cells hold great promise for treating uh, certainly both dilated and ischemic cardiomyopathy. Here at Stanford, we've got the great fortune to have uh, not only great bi uh, uh, um, basic scientists, engineers, imaging experts, but also clinicians and patients that have heart failure. Because of that uh, worldwide uh, recognition in heart transplantation, we get patients from all over the world with heart failure. And we're able to, to, um, to come back to this idea of translational research. Having problems in the clinic, taking them to our labs, working together in, in teams, and then coming up with um, innovative therapies that we take back and, and treat our patients with. So this is a picture from the inside in the operating room of what a heart attack looks like. This is the inside of the left-sided pumping chamber, the left ventricle. This is normal muscle. This is the mitral valve. Blood flows from the, into the, through the mitral valve into the left pumping chamber, the left ventricle, and, and comes through the aortic valve, which you can't see, and is pumped out to the heart, or to, from the heart to the body. So this white area is scar tissue from a large myocardial infarction or a heart attack. One of the coronary arteries was blocked. And so the idea is, how do we treat this? Today, we, we have some conventional operations that I'll show you here in just a second. But um, uh, the other is transplantation. Our idea is that we would replace this scar tissue. We would convert this damaged heart muscle that doesn't beat anymore we could replace that with stem cells and reproduce and regenerate new cardiac tissue and cause the heart to beat stronger and more normally. And I believe it won't be just injection of cells. It'll be a, a, a tissue engineering approach. And this just shows you an example of, a, uh, of cardiac tissue on a matrix to, to produce what's called uh, artificial myocardial tissue that could be reimplanted in an operation first this is how we treat this area of heart attack. You can see this is thinned out. This is the picture I showed you from the inside. This is all thinned out, non-functioning heart muscle. And we simply go in and cut that out and put a Dacron patch. It's like a piece of uh, a cloth that, um, that stays with the patient, but it's rigid and doesn't beat. Think about that artificial myocardium that I showed you. And what, could we make a patch to treat this area of the heart such that uh, these cells would be beating? just like we're doing in the lab today, and we've treated many mice in this way. I think that, um, that this, is, this is the hope of the future, that uh, first we'll do it by a surgical approach, but I believe that eventually we'll have a tissue engineering approach that would be used uh, through a catheter in the, in the uh, cath lab to be able to repopulate this area of damaged heart muscle and restore cardiac function. Just in the last couple of minutes, I, I wanted to just show you another pioneering effort and tell you a little bit about uh, uh, heart failure treating artificial hearts, LVADs. In 1984, Phil Oyer, who's a cardiac surgeon here at Stanford, uh, implanted this device, which de was developed in our labs called the Novacore device. It's a left ventricular assist device, a heart pump, into this gentleman. It was the first time that any person had been kept alive with an artificial heart and, and survived to get a transplant. It's, what's even more remarkable to me about this is that this gentleman, the first person ever in the world, survived for over 20 years with his transplant. All work done here at Stanford. So I think that uh, it's going to be a combination of, uh, of both uh, transplantation, stem cell therapies, and, and artificial heart therapies. 
Uh, we're to the point now where these devices can last for up to five, seven years. The devices are getting smaller, much easier to implant. This is the size of about a, a, a D battery that's placed right into the, to the left ventricle, sucks blood out of the ventricle, and then pumps it out to the aorta and to the body to support uh, our patients. And indeed, if we get this CIRM grant, uh, our is going to be patients that, that require these left ventricular assist devices to get them to a transplant, we're going to inject the embryonic stem cells. We think it's a safe model because we can mitigate the possibility of these cells uh, going out to the body and having teratomas. More gives us a chance when, the, when we take the heart out to do a transplant, we can look under the microscope and look and see how many of these cells survived and if indeed they turned into new heart muscle. So I'm, I'm incredibly excited about that. I just put this last slide in here to show that uh, not only does cardiomyopathy happen in 21-year-olds and 80-year-olds, but it also can happen in newborns. And this is a, a child that Bruce Wrights and I uh, put a, an artificial heart in and about uh, two weeks later got a transplant and is alive and doing well. So just in summary, um, I think that transplants have been remarkable. Over the last 40 years, we've saved thousands of lives. That effort started here at Stanford and is now spread around the world. Additionally, the first successful left ventricular assist device was done here at Stanford. And I believe that we'll be the first place in the world to, to inject embryonic stem cells and demonstrate to the world that stem cell therapy can also be a novel and innovative treatment for heart failure. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your questions. No questions. Wow, OK, there you go. With a large area of infarct and uh, injecting stem cells, there must be a time frame before they come can become active. Right. Are you working on what's the right size um, area to put the stem cells in, and at what point you, you really can't wait for the stem cells to take over? Are those logistic plans going on? So, so that's a very good question. The question had to do with um, how big an area and how you target the area, and can you wait for the stem cells to start taking effect? That's a very good question. It turns out that this first study that we've planned would be a safety study. So, uh, you know, if you were someone who needed a, an artificial heart and we came to you and said, in addition to the artificial heart, we're going to put these embryonic stem cells in because it gives us an opportunity to study the biology of them, to see if they're going to be safe, and then we take them out and look at them under the microscope, as I said. But one of the things that we've thought about, and, you know, we can't make any promises, but as the patient is recovering, it's usually about three months from the time that you get an artificial heart until you're, you, you find a suitable donor uh, that's found for you to do a transplant. So after about a month, our plan is to turn the pump down and look under echo guidance, and we know the area we're going to inject those cells to see if the heart's functioning well, with the idea one day that someone who, who's in, a, in a, an emergent situation and needs an LVAD we can put the cells in at the same time and then slowly wean the LVAD away as the cells start to take over new function. Now, now for people that aren't in that dire strait, uh, I believe that earlier on, so there, there's a spectrum of heart failure that, uh, that, you know, at one end is an LVAD and a transplant, but there, there are signs and I think genetics are going to be able to help us predict who is headed down the pathway of failure. And we want to start to inject those cells earlier so that they can start to divide and incorporate. So we don't know how much time that'll take, but we think it's probably going to be several months. But it's a good question. Yes? Yeah, so what I've described to you so far would be sort of a proof of concept and first step. Uh, and you would need a big operation for the direct injection or to put this uh, tissue engineering patch in. But I'm, I certainly believe that th this, these uh, therapies will be done through a catheter. You'll come in, you'll have a, a catheter go into your heart. We've got sophisticated imaging and locating devices that allow us to uh, find the area of damage and inject cells now. This has been done in, with these bone marrow, adult bone marrow cells. 
Now, there hasn't been much utility because, as I outlined before, they, they don't really work to, to form new heart muscle. But we believe that embryonic stem cells, and I, I think, more importantly, iPS cells, because we can take your own cells and use those. Um, so I think that uh, this is all going to be done uh, minimally invasively. Whether we can do it uh, to prevent uh, damage um, is still up in, in the air. But that's the idea behind a big heart attack so that you would you have a, your artery closed and instead of having a big scar and damaged area that results from a big heart attack, then at the time you're having chest pain, you come into the hospital, this goes on now, and, and usually in less than an hour, if you come into the hospital, your artery is opened up in our cath lab and there's a stent in your artery, and then to use stem cells at that point to, to prevent damage. The areas of the, of the infarct that occurred acutely uh, if you get the stem cells out to try to prevent damage and, and mitigate any scar and, and damage to the heart muscle, because it's a spectrum. You, you get the cells die, and then the, um, and then the heart starts to thin, and the heart gets bigger because it's failing. So acutely, the idea would be to try to prevent any further damage by injecting those cells down the coronary arteries or directly into the heart muscle at the time of a heart attack or earlier on in this spectrum of heart failure but it'll be less invasive for sure. And Pete? Research in PD-34 cells, are those bone marrow? Those are the bone marrow cells. Those are adult bone marrow cells. Okay. And, and then the other question was related to, um, you mentioned the FDA, and I'm in the biotech industry, and a lot of the issues, I mean, the FDA deals with small molecules and has not come around to cell therapy. So how do you see that them kind of getting to a point where they understand what? Well, for us to, for us to, do, this, um, for us to do this cell therapy study, we have to have an investigator-initiated IND today with the FDA. So we've got four years. If we, we find out in June from CIRM, if we get the grant, we've got four years uh, to get to humans, and there, there are tranches of money that come to us uh, depending on the benchmarks that we hit. But one of the early benchmarks is, and as part of our application, we've had to have pre-pre-IND meetings with the FDA. So they're regulating cell therapy today. Uh, certainly, if you, because um, uh, we, we believe that, I, I didn't have time to cover all this, and this gets into a little more detail, but we believe that because these cells, most of which don't survive, we're going to need to genetically modify the cells uh, to, to cause them to differentiate, but also to help them to survive. Because you put them into an environment where it's sort of hostile. There's inflammation. It's in an area where there's not enough blood flow. So you're going to have to have gene therapy in addition to cell therapy, and the FDA gets really concerned about that. So they're, they're definitely regulating them. And the, and the CD34 cells are these adult bone marrow cells that we used in that first study. I will say that there is some, um, there's some suggestion that there are certain paracrine factors, not that the cells will develop into new heart cells, but that there are some factors that can help to grow new blood vessels into an area so that the area around that heart attack, there's a rim of tissue called the uh, transition zone, and to help that area function better by growing new blood cells. So, so that's why people continue to, to use adult bone marrow cells inject into the heart. Ann? Okay. Um, do you envision the stem cell therapy being more useful for one of the types of cardiomyopathy versus the other? The ischemic cardiomyopathy, obviously, blood supply is the problem. So you put new cells in, the blood supply may not be optimized. But with an, ischemic, with an idiopathic cardiomyopathy, it's a much larger area. Right. Do you envision one being better than the other or more useful than the other? Yeah, that's a, that's a veteran question there from Ann, <laughs> who's our chief of staff, by the way, and one of, the, <laughs> one of the best doctors I've ever known. Who, if I get sick, I want her taking care of me. So that's a, that's a good point. I think, I think that everybody has gone, and that's why I said at the, the patient selection side, acute myocardial infarction done in the cath lab down the coronaries, chronic disease, which is either ischemic from a heart attack or idiopathic cardiomyopathy, the Joe Matthews. Uh, I see that the cell therapy is going to be directed toward the ischemics first because that's a defined area that we can see on this uh, devi uh, device called a NOGA device in the cath lab. You can test and see the area that's not moving and using echo, we can direct cells into that infarcted area. 
Um, you're right, I think it's why it's going to be a tissue engineering play with pro-angiogenic factors and pro-survival factors, anti-apoptotic genes, but I believe that's going to be the first place. Now, uh, I didn't have time to really talk about uh, the, the, uh, the resident cardiac cells and whether there are gene therapy strategies that can convert those cells into new cells. I think that's going to be more applicable because those cells are going to be throughout the myocardium, and I think those are going to be more important for these dilated cardiomyopathies. I think the dilated cardiomyopathies, though, the real thing, we're, we're clearly, and you probably heard this across this week, we're clearly moving from an era of diagnose and treat to one of predict and prevent. Predict through the genetic code and try to prevent these diseases. And we really don't know. There's, there's been some suggestion that these dilated cardiomyopathies have to do with viruses, Coxsackie B virus. And so just imagine if you could find a gene that said that one person was more susceptible to a cardiomyopathy, a dilated cardiomyopathy, if they got Coxsackie B virus, and you could develop a vaccine, you could basically eradicate that disease. But for, for um, you know, the, the dilated cardiomyopathies, a stem cell play, I think it's going to have to be resident stem cells that are stimulated to grow new cells. So I'm getting the time's up. I'll, I'll be happy to stay around. We have 15 minutes before we go back to the, uh, the plenary session again. Uh, again, thank you all for being here today. I really enjoyed being with you, and I'll stick around and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.